Welcome to Norse Mythology, the unofficial guide. It's unofficial because I'm neither a credentialed academic nor a time-traveling medieval Norse pagan, but I deal with this material directly from the sources, interpreted through the lens of the experts and their opinions. If you're looking for depth and detail in a simple and accessible way, then you're in the right place. In the spring of 1950, an amazingly preserved forge stone from the Viking Age was discovered on the beach of Horsens Fjord, near Snaptun in Denmark. A forge stone is essentially a barrier that serves to protect a bellows from the intense heat of the fire in a smithing forge. If you haven't seen one before, you can think of it like a little wall with a hole punched through it that allows the bellows to blow air through that hole into the fire. The Snaptun stone is remarkable for a couple of reasons. One is that it's made of steatite, which is also called soapstone, and it doesn't occur naturally in Denmark. Steatite is a good material for making a forged stone because not only is it extremely soft and easy to carve, but it's also highly resistant to heat. The Snoptune stone itself likely comes from one of a few Viking Age steatite quarries that have been identified in Norway. The second reason the Snoptune stone is remarkable is because of what has been carved onto it, specifically a very large face portraying a man with a thin, curly, tie-you-to-the-train-tracks style mustache and a mouth that appears to have been sewn shut. The most common interpretation, of course, is that this is a depiction of the god Loki. Today we're going to talk about the time that Loki got his mouth sewn shut. I'm excited to cover it because this story is traditionally highly embellished by modern authors, and it's full of weird phrasing that's been interpreted in lots of different ways. And to me, it's always fun when we can strip away all the modern fluff and cut down to the raw information we actually have in the source material. So let's get into it. Like most of the stories that tell us the origins of things, this one comes from the Prose Edda, which we're all pretty sure was written by the 13th century Christian Icelandic scholar named Snorri Sturluson. The reason I say pretty sure is because there are actually some really interesting conversations to be had about the manuscripts we have and how they differ from each other and about whether Snorri might have personally actually written this or that. But we'll save all that for a future episode. For now, let's keep assuming Snorri is at least the primary author of the Prose Edda and start by focusing in on what he tells us about the goddess named Siv. Siv, as we've talked about before, is the wife of the god Thor. Her name means connection by marriage, so it kind of looks like it's supposed to just mean something like the wife. Although, this doesn't necessarily mean we have to assume she was viewed as nothing more than a background accessory of Thor's. Generating connections by marriage was an extremely important building block of Norse society, after all. Unfortunately, we don't have too much in the way of a historical record that might have told us a little more about how she actually factored into ancient religion. Snorri had his theories, of course. In his euhemeristic pseudo-historical account, he proposes that Siv was originally a prophetess named Sibyl before those silly old pagans corrupted the pure and Hellenic nature of their ancient deities. Snorri is, like all of us, a product of his time, of course. But since we're not too concerned with total BS, Let's turn our attention instead to modern scholar Gabriel Turville Petre, who had what I think is a much more interesting theory about Siv back in 1964. Bear with me on this for a second. Turville Petre pointed out that the Sami people, who are the indigenous inhabitants of northern Scandinavia, have a thunder god of their own named Horigales, and that this Horigales bears a number of striking resemblances to Thor, including aspects of his physical appearance some of his names, and even the fact that he wields a hammer. There's clearly some cross-pollination going on here, if not a full-scale borrowing of a deity from one culture into the other. But Horigalus is married to a character named Ravdana, whose name Turville Petre identifies with the Rowan tree, and to whom Rowan berries are sacred. So what does that have to do with Siv? Well, there's a story told in both the Prose Edda and in the poem Thorstrapa, wherein Thor is struggling to cross a river because of a strong torrent being created by a Jotun, and the way he's able to save himself is by clinging onto a rowan branch and using it to pull himself safely to shore. And hence comes the saying, Snorri tells us, that, quote, Thor's salvation is a rowan, end quote. 
Turvel Petre goes on to note that the rowan tree was considered holy in Iceland, and that it was revered from the initial settlement on into modern times. The connection we're supposed to make, of course, is that if Thor is identifiable with Horigalis, then perhaps Siv is identifiable with Ravdana. And if so, then the story where Thor clings to the Rowan may preserve in some way the idea of his marriage to Siv, once again associating another deity with a tree. But Thor's salvation or not, given that Siv's name means connection by marriage, and given that her role in the surviving mythology sort of revolves around being a wife, it's interesting that she is attested twice in the Poetic Edda as having been unfaithful to Thor. In the poem Harbarthsleoth, Odin disguises himself as a ferryman and engages in an insult battle with Thor while refusing to ferry him across a body of water. As I've mentioned before, some of Odin's insults are pretty ridiculous here. For example, early on in the poem, he tells Thor, I think your mom is dead. But this is a lie, and later, near the end of the poem, he admits that Thor will actually cross paths with his mother on his journey around the water. So, with that said, Odin also insults Thor here by telling him that, quote, Siv has a lover at home. He's the one you want to meet. That's the test of strength you ought to attempt. That's more pressing for you, end quote. Thor replies to this by saying, quote, You say just what comes into your mouth so that it seems the worst to me, coward. I think you're lying, end quote. Now, we might be tempted to think that this is indeed just another lie. However, there's another story in which this idea returns. In the poem Lokasena, Loki attends a feast where all the gods are gathered, except Thor, of course, who is, can you guess where? Out in the east, as always, where he goes to hunt evil creatures. Anyway, at this feast, Loki goes around the room, insulting everyone in turn, with the worst things he can think of to say to each of them. The other gods respond to this in various ways. Some accuse him of lying, some insult him back, some stay silent. Siv tries to preempt his insults by offering him a drink, and asking him to admit that she is the only blameless one in the room. Loki replies by saying, quote, You would be the only one, if you were so, were cautious and reluctant with a man. I know one, and I think I do know, a lover besides Thor. And that was the malevolent Loki. End quote. Siv does not respond. Despite this plausible infidelity with Loki, we have no reason to assume that Thor is actually on any bad terms with Siv. We also don't know for sure when or how this incident might have occurred. But as our story picks up today, Snorri tells us that for no other reason than the love of mischief, Loki once cut off all of Siv's hair. In Caroline Larrington's footnotes in her translation of Lokasena, she suggests that Loki's alleged tryst with Siv could have been what allowed him to get close enough to do this. Although we don't really know for sure if these incidents are actually supposed to be connected. Regardless, when Thor finds out Loki had cut off all of his wife's hair, he is furious about it. He catches Loki, which is a pretty commonly repeated theme, and threatens to break every bone in his body. But Loki swears he can fix this problem by getting some black elves to make Siv a new head of hair out of gold that will magically grow just like normal hair. Now, this is the first time we've encountered the phrase black elves on the show, so let's pause for a second to try and get a clear picture of what they are. The prose edda uses the phrase black elves exactly three times. This is one of those three, and there is no surviving material from the pagan period that mentions them at all. The other two instances in the prose edda are two different stories wherein characters make a journey into the realm of black elves. One of those stories is this one, but in both cases, when a character goes to Black Elf Land, or Svartalfheimer as it's called, the beings they encounter there are referred to as dwarves. So for this reason, most scholars believe that the prose Edda is using Black Elf as a synonym for dwarf. In that case, it's possible that dwarves are actually supposed to be a subset of elves, but if so, we're still left with the murky problem of trying to define what an elf is generally. The prose Edda also uses another similar phrase, Dark Elves, twice. Like before, there are no pre-Christian writings containing this phrase. When the phrase is used, Snorri is contrasting what he calls Light Elves, who he says live in heaven and are fair to look at, with Dark Elves, who he says live underground and are blacker than pitch. Because we can already identify Snorri's Black Elves with dwarves, 
And since he describes dark elves as black and says they live in the ground, which is exactly where dwarves live, I side with John Lindau in the opinion that Snorri probably didn't intend for us to think of dark elves and black elves as different groups. I personally subscribe to the idea that both of these words are just synonyms for dwarves. This would explain why the very next thing Loki does after promising to get some black elves to make new hair is to meet with a couple of dwarves and ask them to make new hair. These particular dwarves are known as Ewaldi's sons. We know absolutely nothing about who Ewaldi is himself, just that his sons are dwarves who can make magic things. We also know absolutely nothing about the actual conversation Loki had with Ewaldi's sons. All we know is that the result of their meeting is that they end up creating three magic objects. Along with new golden hair for Siv, they also craft a spear for Odin named Gungnir and a ship for Freyr called Skidblathnir. We'll come back to these shortly. The next thing Loki does is make a wager with another dwarf named Brokkr regarding his brother Atri's smithing abilities. We aren't told why he does this, or even why he finds it necessary to return to Osgarther with anything more than Siv's new hair. But for whatever reason, Loki decides to wager his own head against Atri being able to create three precious objects as good as the ones he's already gotten from Ewaldi's sons. If Atri can do it, Broker gets Loki's head. By the way, note how commonly dwarves tend to show up as pairs of brothers. So far, we've covered the brothers Fjallar and Galar, who made the meat of poetry, Ewaldi's sons, who made Siv's hair, Odin's spear, and Freyr's ship, and now we have the brothers Brokkr and Atri, who are about to give us even more fantastic creations. Dwarves don't always come in pairs, but it does seem to happen quite a lot. When Brokkr and Atri get back to their workshop, Atri starts by tossing a pig's hide into the forge and assigning Brokkr to the bellows. He tells Brokkr not to stop blowing until the hide is removed from the forge. Brokkr gets to work, but... As he's working the bellows, a fly finds its way into the workshop and settles on his arm. It bites him a little bit, but he ignores it and keeps working. Before too long, Atri pulls from the forge a magnificent boar with bristles made of gold. Next, he places a chunk of gold into the forge and instructs Broker again not to stop working the bellows, just as before. As Broker starts working, the fly reappears, and this time it settles on his neck and bites him twice as hard as it did before. It's almost as if this fly has some agenda of trying to get Brokkr to fail at following Atri's instructions. It's the sort of thing we might expect a crafty shapeshifter whose head was on the line in a wager to do. But Brokkr is able to ignore the fly's bites a second time until Atri pulls from the forge a golden ring that he names Draupnir. Lastly, Atri puts some iron in the forge and gives the same instructions to Brokkr a third time. Don't stop blowing. If there is any pause at all in the working of the bellows, it could ruin the whole process. Brokkr gets to work, but this time the fly is determined to cause sabotage. It settles between Brokkr's eyes and starts nibbling on his eyelids, which causes blood to run into his eyes and obstruct his vision. Finally, Brokkr's had enough. He stops mid-compression just once to swipe the fly away as fast as he can. And when Atri pulls the last item out of the forge, he realizes that it had come very close to being completely ruined. But fortunately, it's still usable. It just has one small defect. The last item is the famous hammer Mjolnir, and its one imperfection is that its handle is noticeably short. Atri bundles up the items, hands them to Broker, and instructs him to travel to Osgarther to fulfill the wager. When he arrives, Brokkr and Loki decide to present their respective items to the gods and let them judge which is best. The gods take their places on their judgment seats, which you'll recall are located at the base of Yggdrasil, and probably near the Well of Fate, Urdabrunner. And they determine that whatever decision is made by the agreement of Odin, Thor, and Freyr would be final. This reigning triad of Odin, Thor, and Freyr was also echoed by Adam of Bremen in 10th century Germany, when he described a trio of idols he had heard were housed at a pagan temple in Uppsala. I like to imagine them appearing in this situation as Adam described them in his second-hand account, with Thor occupying a throne in the middle, flanked on either side by Odin, armed for war, and Freyr sporting his characteristic, quote, immense phallus. Just, you know, showing it off. 
Loki begins by handing the spear called Gungnir to Odin, the golden hair to Thor, and the ship called Skidbladnir to Freyr, and then proceeds to explain their magical properties. If you are a connoisseur of retellings of Norse myths, you have probably heard a lot of things about Gungnir, that it always hits its target when thrown, or that it always returns to Odin's hand, but regardless of what you may have heard, this is where we get our only explanation of what makes Gungnir special, which is, as Loki explains it, that, quote, the spear never stopped in its thrust, end quote. That's it. That's all we get. It never stops in its thrust. Now, that's kind of a weird phrase, so rather than just relying on the Falk's translation here, I took a look at the original Old Norse to see if maybe there's something I was missing. As it turns out, the phrase in the manuscript is Gerin nam aldri stother i logi, which means quite literally, the spear never stopped in a thrust. Okay, so what does it mean for a spear to be stopped in a thrust? It seems to me that a spear wouldn't just stop in the middle of a thrust on its own for no reason. It would have to be stopped by encountering a shield or armor or a parry by another weapon. So based on the actual information we have, I feel pretty comfortable saying that Gungnir's one magical property we know of is that it will push through or penetrate anything that would stop a normal spear from striking its target. You can't block it and you can't protect yourself against it. While we're on the topic, Gungnir means the rocking or swaying one, and my guess is that this is probably a reference to how spears quickly flex back and forth while they're flying through the air, kind of like a javelin does if you've ever seen a javelin throw competition, or even an arrow on a larger scale. The one other thing we know about Gungnir comes from the poem Sigurdrifumol, in which a Valkyrie is teaching the hero Sigurdr about rune magic. She references an instance from a long-since-forgotten poem about Odin obtaining the runes and conversing with Mimir's head while standing on a cliff wearing a helmet and holding the sword of the Jotun Brimir, which may or may not be another name for the first of the Jotnar, Ymir, who Odin killed alongside his brothers. Mimir's head begins to speak at this point and explains where runes ought to be carved. Some of the places he names are common, such as on a shield, or on glass, or on gold, or amulets, or on your favorite chair. And some of the places are only available for gods to carve on, such as on Sleipnir's teeth, and on the god Bragi's tongue, and of course, on the tip of Gungnir. We don't know exactly which runes might be carved there, or whether or not they are meant to actually do anything, but we can probably assume Odin has followed Mimir's advice and carved some runes onto it. Siv's new hair, as promised, is made entirely of gold, and as soon as it comes in contact with her head, it becomes rooted into the flesh and is able to grow normally, as if it was her natural hair. It doesn't have a special name, and it doesn't have any other magical abilities, other than possibly contributing to making her, as Snorri says in his Euhemerized account, the most beautiful of all women. But keep in mind, that's the same account wherein he asserted that the Euhemerized Thor killed his own father to inherit the throne of Thrace. Snorri also gives the title of most beautiful of all women to two other women, specifically to a Jotun woman who ends up marrying Freyr, named Gerther, and also to a human woman, specifically the hero Sigurdr's daughter, Swanhildr. Interestingly, Snorri never calls Freya the most beautiful of all women. However, she does seem to fit the part. People are trying to get Freya's hand in marriage pretty much all the time, and we do know that when the Jotun Hrungnir got drunk and started trash-talking, it was both Freya and Siv that he wanted to carry back home with him. Loki's third gift, the ship called Skidblathnir, which translates to something weird like the one leafed with planks, and probably just means like made of planks, is given to Freyr. There are a few things that are special about Skidbladnir, the most memorable of which is that it can be folded up like a cloth and carried around in your pocket. It also immediately catches a fair wind whenever the sail is raised to wherever it is intended to go. Elsewhere, Snorri tells us that it is the best of ships, which is confirmed by the poem Grimnismal, although it is not the largest of ships. That honor goes to the ship Nagelfar, which is the property of Muspel. However, Skidbladnir is large enough to fit all the Asir with all of their weapons and war gear. With Loki having completed presenting his gifts, the spear, the hair, and the ship, it now becomes Broker's turn. 
First, he gives the golden ring called Draupnir to Odin. Draupnir just means dripper, and the reason why, as Broker explains, is that it will magically drip out eight more gold rings of equal weight for a total of nine gold rings, and it will do this every ninth night. Elsewhere, Snorri clarifies that Draupnir is actually an arm ring as opposed to a finger ring, so it's nice and big. Next, Broker presents the boar with golden bristles to Freyr, and explains that it can run faster than any horse, even across the sky and across the sea, by day or by night, and that its bristles are so ridiculously shiny that no matter how dark a place can get, they will still give off enough light to make the place, quote, bright enough. The boar's name is Gulenbursti, which literally just means golden bristles, and we have a couple of attestations of Freyr either riding it or having his chariot pulled by it. As the pièce de résistance, Broker hands Mjolnir to Thor, and explains its abilities in such a way that if you don't pay close attention to Snorri's writing style, they can actually be kind of easy to misinterpret. The Fox translation says that by using Mjolnir, Thor would be able to, quote, strike as heavily as he liked, whatever the target, and the hammer would not fail, and if he threw it at something, it would never miss, and never fly so far that it would not find its way back to his hand, and if he liked, it was so small that it could be kept inside his shirt. But there was this defect in it that the end of the handle was rather short." At face value, there are all sorts of things we might pull from this phrasing. That Mjolnir is heavy, that Thor can magically hit a target as hard as he wants, that maybe it can shrink and become small enough to fit into his shirt, and if so, then maybe grow again, and so on. So, to get at what Snorri is really saying here, I've done my own translation of the original Old Norse, sticking with more literal meanings of some of the words that are used, and more stringently applying some contextual nuances to others. If you'd like to check it for yourself, this is from Skald Skapermal 35. Quote, Then he gave Thor the hammer, and said that he would be able to strike as greatly as he wanted at whatever was before him that the hammer would not crack. Also, if he threw it, then it would never miss and never fly so far that it wouldn't return to his hand. Also, if he wanted, then it was so little that he could carry it in his cirque. End quote. So firstly, we don't actually see Snorri use the Old Norse word for heavy here. In fact, the sources never tell us anything about Mjolnir's weight. What Snorri is telling us about Mjolnir's first property is that no matter how hard Thor hits something with it, it will never break. The word I've translated as break here is bila, which can also mean fail, as we saw it in the Falks translation, but in the context of weapons, this is how Old Norse expresses the idea of a weapon cracking during use. Secondly, if the hammer is thrown, it will never miss and never fly too far to be able to return to Thor's hand. That part is all pretty self-explanatory. The third property is clearly related to the hammer being little enough to be carried in a, quote, cirque. A cirque is a lot like a long thigh-length t-shirt. If worn underneath another shirt, the whole ensemble would usually be tied with a belt. So it would seem that the only way to carry something in a cirque without needing to get undressed in order to get it back out again would be to wear it as a pendant, perhaps in the style of the hundreds of Mjolnir pendants that have been found by archaeologists dating to the Viking Age. This is a pretty common interpretation, and I'm okay with it, given that I can't imagine how else carrying it in a cirque would work. But the question then becomes, exactly how big is Thor, and exactly how small is this hammer with a defectively short handle in its normal state? Can he wear the hammer as a pendant around his neck without the need for it to shrink down first? The text in the Prose Edda doesn't use any of the Old Norse words we might expect to find that would describe a change from one state into another. The hammer doesn't become little. It doesn't decrease. It doesn't wane. It simply was little. So I think it might be possible that Broker is simply trying to say that if Thor would like to carry it in his cirque, it was little enough to allow him to do that, possibly as a way of putting a positive spin on this defectively short handle. We should also notice that there are a few traditional ideas about the hammer that are glaringly absent here. Firstly, there are no restrictions given on who can and can't use it or carry it. In this story, we've seen it carried by two dwarves, and in the poem Thrymskvida, it gets stolen by Jotnar, so Marvel's worthiness factor is right out the window. 
there are also no thunder or lightning powers enumerated here. More importantly, although Snorri told us many chapters ago that Thor must not be without his iron gloves when gripping the hammer, they are not mentioned here when it is created or when it is explained to him. It's worth noting, however, that we do see Thor performing other actions with Mjolnir that aren't specified in this story. Specifically, at Baldur's funeral, just before kicking a dwarf into the fire, Thor consecrates the funeral pyre with his hammer, and in another story, after killing his two goats in order to have dinner, he resurrects them the following day, again by some process involving the hammer. So there would appear to be more to the total package than just what Brokkr explains to Thor here in Snorri's account. In any case, the gods agree that Mjolnir is the best of all the magical objects presented, as it would provide the best defense against the Hrimthursar, which means that Loki has just lost his wager, and that Brokkr now owns his head. Loki immediately begins trying to negotiate with Brokkr, and offers to buy his own head back from the dwarf, but Brokkr refuses. Catch me then, Loki exclaims, and proceeds to run away. He outpaces the dwarf, and uses a pair of special shoes that we are just now finding out that he owns, that allow him to run across both the sky and the sea. So, Brokkr asks Thor to catch Loki, and since this is a commonly repeated theme, he just does, somehow. And with Loki now presumably restrained, Brokkr prepares to decapitate him. But before he's able to do so, Loki declares a legal loophole. Although the dwarf may own rights to his head, he doesn't have any right to damage his neck. And this is technically true. So Brokkr decides to sew Loki's mouth shut instead. He gets a cord and a knife and begins trying to stab holes in Loki's lips, but the knife isn't cutting. So the dwarf magically conjures up an awl in this really interesting way, where he states that it would be better if the knife's brother all were present, and then it magically appears, similarly to the way Thor magically appears whenever his own name is invoked. The all is then able to pierce through Loki's lips just fine, Brokkr stitches Loki's lips together, and as the story ends, it quote, tore the edges off, end quote. This is apparently why we end up with the face of a man with sewn together lips carved into the front of a Viking Age forge stone, and why a forge stone is a sensible place to display such a thing. Once again, we have a Prosetta account seeming to be corroborated by a pre-Christian source. Of course, it still leaves us with a ton of questions. For example, this is just one of many hints at an old association between Loki and fire. But where does that association come from, and what does it really mean? While the mythological Loki is clearly not a god of fire, in other words, he never magically creates or controls fire, and in the one story where he has a competition with fire, he loses, he does end up in close proximity to fire and forges and hearths pretty often, which is all we really mean when we say a character is associated with something anyway. Also, given Loki's role in this story, what exactly did the owner of the Snaptoon Forge Stone really intend by carving his face into it? Was it just supposed to be a decoration, a fun reminder of a fun story? Was he trying to ward Loki away as a being who might want to sabotage his smithing projects? Why is Thor always the one who catches Loki? Why did Loki wager his head against Brokkr and Atri in the first place? Why did he bring back so many more gifts than the golden hair he promised to get for Siv? With so few details actually given in the story, what was so important about the strange incident where Brokkr conjures up an awl that it made its way all the way down into Snorri's time? Exactly how common was this idea that invoking the name of something would cause it to appear? And most importantly, where did Loki get those fabulous flying shoes? Sadly, we may never know where Loki's shoes came from. We can only speculate that dwarves were probably involved. So let's continue speculating together next time on Norse Mythology, The Unofficial Guide. Sources for this episode include Avelstein by PV Globe 1959, Myth and Religion in the North, The Religion of Ancient Scandinavia by Gabriel Turvel Petre 1964, The History of the Archbishops of Hamburg Bremen by Adam of Bremen 10th Century, translated by Francis Chan, Norse Mythology, A Guide to the Gods, Heroes, Rituals, and Beliefs by John Lindau 2001. The Poetic Edda, translated by Caroline Larrington, 2014, and The Prose Edda, translated by Anthony Falks, 1995.